Uh, so, uh, so we talked about some of the events in the ninth uh, year of the Hijra, uh, including uh, the Battle of Tabuk, which was a great victory for the Muslims because uh, the enemy did not show up. Uh, and one thing you would have realized is that um, while uh, the problems uh, in the Arabian Peninsula itself were coming to an end, uh, something else was developing, and that is um, the threat uh, from the Byzantines and the Roman Empire. Uh, they were taking a keen look at uh, what is happening in uh, in Arabia uh, with the development of Islam and the Islamic State in Medina and so on. Uh, and they were perhaps uh, feeling threatened by it. And I mentioned uh, not only, uh, you know, as uh, political, uh, you know, people who are looking at things uh, on a political level, uh, uh, and they were the superpower, well, at least one of the superpowers in uh, in the time, uh, but also uh, they were Christians and they were seeing the growth of this uh, religion uh, that could be threatening to them. Uh, uh, among the other things that happened in the ninth year uh, is, uh, you know, after the return book, uh, sometime after that, uh, was the death of uh, the chief of hypocrites, uh, Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul. Uh, he died, uh, and after his death, of the those who were following him. Uh, did not have leadership anymore, and so uh, they they stopped a lot of the mischief, uh, and they joined the ranks of uh, the sincere uh, believers. Uh, so that issue was also coming to an end, except that you know hypocrisy or nifaq uh, never really comes to an end. Uh, in every Islamic society, you have that. In every country, uh, you have that. Uh, so you always have to be aware that there are hypocrites within the ranks or people who will do things uh, that a hypocrite would do. And they're not necessarily hypocrites, but uh, there is some weakness in them. Uh, and uh, sometimes uh, because of that weakness, uh, they're deceived uh, by others. Uh, and so they can be very harmful uh, for the growth of Islam in any society. And so hypocrisy and the problems that come out of that, uh, even uh, with people who might be sincere but weak uh, are not having a deeper understanding uh, themselves of you know how things uh, develop, of the character and personalities of people and so on. Uh, you know, th th that sort of situation uh, will always exist. The ninth year of the Hijra, is also known as Amul Wufud, the year of deputations. Al Wufud, uh, the plural, it is the plural of Waft, and Waft means a delegation or deputation. Uh, so uh, this is the year in which, uh, after the conquest of Mecca, uh, many of the Arabian, most of the Arabian tribes, uh, were seeing that they had no alternative but to join Islam one way or the other. There were those who were convinced about Islam, and so they came or they sent uh, delegations, deputations to the Prophet wasalam, to declare their acceptance of Islam, uh, and basically to join the ranks of Muslims. And so the Prophet wasalam, was receiving them in Medina. Uh, there were also those who came to accept Islam, but they were not necessarily convinced uh, fully, 100% uh, of the teachings of Islam, uh, but they perhaps also felt uh, that they had no alternative but to join the force. Uh, this was a rising force in the Arabian Peninsula, uh, and it would be best for them to be on good terms with them, uh, to have treaties with them so that, uh, you know, they will not, uh, you know, be attacked or anything like that by Muslims. Uh, so uh, they also felt the need uh, to come and uh, become Muslims, uh, and, you know, to uh, join the ranks uh, of, you know, the Muslims. Uh, but there were also other uh, other tribes who were sending their deputations. They were not necessarily uh, believers uh, uh, and did not have an intention, perhaps, of, uh, of uh, declaring their acceptance of Islam. Uh, but they wanted to ensure that they, are, you know, they have a good relationship with the Muslims, uh, so that you know, there will be no enmity and hostility. So there are those who accepted Islam, 
thinking that you know that will safeguard them from uh, any hostility with Muslims, uh, with this growing power. And there are others who did not accept Islam uh, for the same reason also. Uh, you know, for the same reason, accepting Islam by coming, uh, sending delegations uh, to the Prophet wasallam, maybe to establish a treaty with him uh, to have some uh, understanding between them and cooperation and so on. So this was Amul Wafud, the year of deputations. So, so we can see that for various reasons, uh, people came, uh, either made treaties with uh, Islam, uh, with the Prophet wasallam, or they joined uh, the ranks of Muslims. Among them uh, was the tribe of Thaqif, uh, we mentioned him briefly, uh, we, uh, that tribe that is, uh, uh, briefly the last time, and we had talked about uh, their participation in the Battle of uh, Hunain uh, with uh, the rest of Hawazin, the tribe, the you know very huge tribe of Hawazin uh, with different branches. Uh, Thaqif was one of the branches, and they were uh, they were uh, living in Taif. Uh, many years ago, the Prophet ﷺ had come there, as you know, from the Maki Sira, and they had uh, refused uh, to uh, accept him, and they had kicked him out and treated him badly and so on. Uh, and now the situation was changed. He was dominant, uh, and they now sent a delegation of uh, people uh, to uh, accept Islam. So they came and they accepted Islam, and the prophet, when they started to hear, you know, the conditions of uh, uh, of Islam, you know, that they would have to abide with, there were some things uh, that they, they did not uh, want to accept, and they asked uh, the prophet ﷺ for concessions. Uh, some of those things are in the area of uh, the laws of Islam. Uh, uh, the laws concerning uh, such as um, uh, intoxicants, uh, they wanted to be exempted from uh, the Islamic law. The Prophet Sallallahu refused uh, to do that. Uh, you, you know, th this is something that we cannot compromise on. Uh, they wanted a concession in relation to zina, uh, adultery, fornication, and so on. Uh, these things <laughs> apparently were too deep uh, within the society. Uh, they were in concession for, the, for for that, and the Prophet again refused. Uh, so um, uh, and also um, khamar, uh, uh, well alcohol. We we mentioned alcohol and riba, uh, riba uh, interest. Uh, they said that that was the basis of their economy. Uh, the Prophet refused uh, to allow them to continue with it. Uh, it spoke to it. Uh, so eventually they accepted these things, and then they also raised the matter of uh, the destruction of the idol. When the Prophet ﷺ, you know, instructed them that they have to destroy the idol that was there in Taif, which is the, the idol of Al-Lat, one of the main idols in the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, uh, they started to balk, uh, balk against that, right? I <laughs> think they recoiled. Uh, they felt something bad would happen to them if they dis if they destroyed a, a lot, and they did not want to do it. They said, they said okay, give us uh, three years, uh, and then we'll do it. He said, no. They said, two years. He said, no. They said, one year. He said, no. Six months, no. Three months, <laughs> no. One month, uh, a couple of weeks. The Prophet ﷺ did not give them any time at all. This is something that has to be done immediately. Once you go back to Taif, uh, you will have to destroy uh, the idols that are there, and of course, especially the bigger one, uh, all that. Uh, but he gave them one concession in this regard. He said, okay, um, don't break it with your own hands. Uh, I'll give you that concession that you do not have to with your own hand, uh, but I'll send people, send some of the Sahara to bring uh, for you. Uh, so he sent uh, some, um, uh, including Abu Sufyan, 
Uh, and the men that he chose, uh, I, I can't recall the names of all of them, but Abu Sufyan was one of them. Uh, and, you know, the reason that he chose him as well as the others is that most of them were uh, you know, recently mushrikeen. They had given up shirk and they had come into Islam and some of them were leaders. Abu Sufyan, as you know, was a leader of uh, Mecca until the conquest of Mecca. Uh, that is when he accepted Islam. So it was not long uh, you know, ago that he had, he had come into Islam and given up shirk. Uh, so uh, the, the him coming to Ataif uh, as you know, one of those who came to destroy the idols, uh, it would have uh, it would have it would have a great impact on on the people of Taif, Saqif. Uh, so they're all there now, and they see this uh, delegation of Muslims, a group a small group of Muslims coming, uh, you know, sent by the Prophet Sallam to destroy the idols, uh, and the, the idols are destroyed. Uh, a lot is destroyed, and they are waiting for something to happen. They're waiting for some course and or, or you know the idol to take revenge on them and so on. Nothing happens. So you know everything goes about you know peacefully and so on, right? And then of course uh, that makes them realize that uh, their gods or goddesses, uh, because Lat is one of the goddesses, right? Uh, did not have any power, could not do anything, could not help themselves, uh, do not have any power of their own, and so on. Uh, so they realize this in a very vivid way by seeing the idols destroyed in front of them. Uh, and, uh, you know, eventually you have to fast forward a bit. After the death of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when a lot of the tribes that were new to Islam, that were shaky, very still very shaky, uh, when they uh, rebelled against uh, the Islamic State, when they rebelled against Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, who had become the Khalifa, and uh, some of them, you know, refused to pay zakat, and that sort of thing. Uh, and then uh, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu had to send uh, an army against, had, had to send Sahaba to fight them, uh, to bring them back into Islam or to get them to pay, pay zakat and so on. Thaqif was not one of uh, those tribes that rebelled. Uh, they remained firm in Islam. So this is surprising, you know, based on uh, that uh, discussion that they had with the Prophet and trying to make, uh, trying to get him to accept compromises and so on, right? Uh, they seem to be very fearful of giving up shirk and giving up the worship of idols and so on. Uh, but yet, to capture Islam, they, they were so sincere uh, that they did not give up Islam, you know, when other tribes, uh, were rebelling against uh, the Islamic leadership. Uh, uh, then in the ninth year, there was also the visit of a, a deputation from the Christians of Najran. Najran is uh, in the south uh, and uh, perhaps uh, close to Yemen. Uh, and the Christians came to the Prophet وسلم, to have discussions with him. Uh, perhaps to try to understand the reality of who he was and what he was teaching and so on. They did not accept Islam. Yeah, they went back well by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. At the end of the ninth year of the Hijra uh, comes the Hajj, right? The Hajj comes. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam appoints Abu Bakr uh, in that year, uh, Mushrikeen uh, from uh, various parts of the Arabian Peninsula uh, still came for Hajj. You know, they participated in the Hajj also. Uh, but the Prophet said to him, himself, uh, he did not go. Uh, uh, you know, be, uh, that is, uh, uh, before that, let me say that the Mushrikeen who came and they uh, participated in the Hajj 
uh, they did things uh, in their own way, of course, not uh, in the Islamic way, in the proper way, uh, with all of the deviations uh, from the uh, middle of Ibrahim, alayhi salam, including, you know, some of them uh, going around the Kaaba naked and so on. So the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, لا أحب أن أحج حتى لا يكون ذلك. I do not wish to make Hajj until all of that has been removed. All of these uh, un-Islamic things, uh, once they're removed, inshallah. So now, while uh, Abu Bakr is gone to lead the Hajj, uh, Surah Al-Tawbah is revealed to the Prophet wasallam, or at least portions of it, because the Surah is a very long Surah, uh, as you all know, and portions of it were revealed at different times. So perhaps uh, different portions of it are revealed earlier uh, than uh, the end of uh, the ninth year of the Hijra. So while Abu Bakr is gone, uh, leading the Hajj, the, 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 the beginning part of the surah was revealed. Uh, and we see in it Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, saying that after this year, the mushrikeen will be banned from Mecca. They cannot come into Mecca. Uh, they are najis. In the mushrik, in the mal mushrikun and najasun, fala yaqarabul masjid and haram, bada amihim hada. They are najis, uh, they are unclean. Uh, they should not be allowed to enter into Mecca after this year of theirs. Uh, so from uh, henceforth now, they will be banned. They cannot come for either Umrah or Hajj. And also, uh, the proclamation was made uh, that nobody after this time will be allowed to make Hajj or Umrah uh, naked. So all of the things were, cl were cleaned up. The Hajj and the Umrah and so on were cleaned up, and everything was made totally Islamic. So the following year, everything will be uh, according uh, to Islamic teachings and according to the Milla of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Uh, also, uh, in the beginning portion of Surah Al Tawbah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave four months of respite uh, to the Mushrikeen. And then the treaties uh, with them will come to an end. And there are some differences of opinion among scholars. Uh, uh, the, what does this mean? Does it mean that all of the treaties that the Prophet had with all of the Mushrikeen, the tribes who had not accepted Islam, the ones who were still Mushrikeen, uh, all of those treaties will come to an end? Does it mean that? Uh, and henceforth would be perhaps fighting with them. Uh, nothing will be accepted from them uh, except uh, if they accepted Islam. Right? Uh, uh, that is uh, one interpretation, uh, but there's another interpretation uh, of uh, w what it means, uh, what this declaration really is. Uh, those uh, with whom the Prophet Sallam had a term limit, you know, he made a treaty with them, but up to a certain period of time, uh, maybe for a few years or a few months, however long it was, for a few months, for a few years, uh, uh, then uh, 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 the, uh, Allah in, in the surah uh, says uh, complete the term with them complete the term uh, in other words those uh, whose terms were fixed the agreement will come to or the treaty will come to an end after a specific time complete that to the end of his time don't change it uh, don't break it don't break the treaty with them uh, uh, but uh, continue it until the end of the time. And those uh, with whom there is no treaty at all, they will be given four months. Or those who, who had an open-ended treaty, no term limit, give them four months. And this seemed to be uh, more reasonable, a, a better understanding of what divorces are saying, because uh, the verses did say that uh, uh, the, uh, the treaties uh, should be observed uh, to the end. What does it mean? It means uh, those uh, with whom there's a term limit. Uh, you know, continue that treaty until the end. 
but those who did not have a term limit or those uh, who did not have any treaty with the Prophet uh, they will be given four months in which they have to think about Islam and if they accepted Islam, all well and good. Uh, if not, uh, then uh, it will be an open declaration of war. Uh, uh, and we know the hadith uh, of the Prophet وسلم, where he says, Umirtu an uqatil an nasa hatta yashhadu annahu la ilaha illallah wa anna muhammad ar rasulullah. I have been ordered to fight the people until they declare la ilaha illallah muhammad ar rasulullah. Uh, and there's the other hadith that says that it is not lawful to shed blood except in three cases. You know, uh, and this is uh, one of them. Uh, uh, um, so the, uh, it seems that, uh, you know, the better interpretation of uh, such uh, statements uh, and such a hadith uh, of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is not that he is declaring a fight against everyone uh, and that he is forcing them to convert to Islam uh, or otherwise it will be continuous fighting with them. We see that this is not what took place. Uh, this is not to, what took place with the Sahaba also. Uh, although, you know, they were involved in uh, fighting a lot of people, including the, those who apo apostatized uh, from Islam uh, after the death of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But uh, uh, did they wage war against uh, those uh, who were not like that and who did not wage war against them and so on it uh, doesn't seem to be the case uh, so it is not every mushrik uh, that uh, you have to wage war against until they accept islam uh, those who are peaceful you you continue to be peaceful with them <clears throat> uh, but you know once they show hostility the, you know the hadith uh, I'm ordered to fight the people, meaning perhaps those who are hostile, those who continue to show hostility until they make that declaration of La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, or until, uh, of course, also it, it would be until they submit uh, and they accept, uh, you know, they, they surrender, that is, uh, to Muslims, uh, and they accept Islamic law over them. Uh, now we move on. So the year nine is finished. Uh, in, Ra in Ramadan of the next year, uh, that is year 10, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, uh, this, these are, you know, some indications that the death of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is drawing close. Among the indications is that in Ramadan, he made etikaf for 20 days instead of 10. Usually in the previous years, it was 10 days in Ramadan at the Kaf. Uh, in this year, it was 20. And also during Ramadan, Jibril uh, would review the entire Quran that was revealed up to that point in time uh, with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam once. And in this Ramadan uh, of the 10th year, and later on, the Prophet uh, told, uh, you know, one of the reports uh, that he told Fatima, radiallahu anha, when he was sick, uh, when, you know, he was uh, more or less on his deathbed. And he told her something in secret, uh, and she started crying. Uh, this was that his death was very close. And one of the things, uh, apparently, he said to her uh, is that uh, Jibril... Uh, reviewed the Quran with him twice, uh, which was not usual, and this is an indication that his death was there. Uh, in Shawwal, son Ibrahim dies, because he was an infant. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not allow any of his sons uh, to live, uh, you know, for very long. They all died in their infancy. So Ibrahim uh, dies. Now, uh, one uh, may want to ask the question, why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, not allow uh, any of his sons uh, to uh, live, you know, until they become uh, adults? 
Uh, and there is a great wisdom in that. We won't discuss it in in any detail. We just think about it. Uh, it is something that could cause a lot of fitna afterwards. The Prophet وسلم, is supposed to be the the final messenger, the seal of prophets. After him, there is no other prophet. But if a son of his survives and becomes an adult and so on, you know, people would have other ideas. Uh, and we see what happened uh, uh, and what continues to happen among the Shia themselves, right? Uh, a lot of fitna can occur. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to keep that away from the Ummah. Unfortunately, I mean, um, uh, the Shia, some of the Shia and so on still, uh, you know, this was, uh, this was a great fitna. This situation was a great fitna for them, not a son, but his cousin, his son-in-law, Ali, radiallahu anhu. <laughs> So we leave that uh, that uh, there can be a lot more uh, discussions on uh, on it. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he sends uh, Mu'adh ibn Jabal as governor of Yemen, you know, to teach the people there Islam. Uh, they had accepted Islam. So as uh, you know, he as Mu'adh is going out of Medina, the Prophet sallam goes with him walks with him, he is riding, Mu'adh is riding, the Prophet is walking, and he says, Ya Mu'adh, innaka asa alla talqani ba'da ami hadha. Perhaps you will not meet me again after this year. Wala'allaka an tamurra bi masjidi wa qabri. Perhaps you will pass by my masjid and my grave. In other words, the Prophet ﷺ is uh, indicating that his death is near and Mu'adh, uh, when he come, whenever he comes back to Medina, the Prophet ﷺ will not be alive again. Uh, so Mu'adh started to weep. Uh, and the Prophet ﷺ says to him, La tamki ya Mu'adh, O Mu'adh, do not weep. In al buka'a min al shaitan. Weeping, crying is from the devil. Uh, of course, he does not mean that uh, generally, you know, weeping, uh, most, most uh, weeping is acceptable Islamically. Uh, but maybe uh, it is the way that Mu'adh was weeping at that time. Perhaps he, he was crying out aloud or something. Allahu alam. Uh, I don't see, you know, a description of it here. Uh, so maybe that is what the Prophet was warning him about. Uh, uh, don't uh, do that. Don't weep aloud. Or don't shout or anything like that. Um, but weeping, shedding tear, tears, and so as we know from the death of Ibrahim, the son of the Prophet himself, you know, he shed tears. Uh, he said, you know, the heart feels sad and the eyes weep, uh, the eyes shed tears, uh, but we don't say anything or do anything that is displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, so a number of uh, things occur that shows that uh, the death of the Prophet is coming closer and closer. Uh, now closer to uh, the end of the year, uh, he announces that he is going for Hajj. Uh, and as soon as he makes that announcement, of course, a lot of people want to go with him. And he begins preparation for Hajj in the Qa'dah. And he invites others uh, to go along with him. And many do. Many people from within Medina, thousands of people from within Medina, and the tribes all around and all the Muslim, you know, all of those tribes all, all over the Arabian Peninsula who had, you know, accepted Islam. Uh, they all wanted to come with him. So few, a huge amount of people from, came from all over the Arabian Peninsula to Hajj with the Prophet wasallam. Some reports say over 100,000, some say 120,000. 140,000 people. Allahu alam. These are just uh, 
estimations, uh, you know, approximate uh, amounts. Uh, but perhaps we can say uh, there was no less than 100,000, perhaps much more than that, 120, 140,000 people who came for Hajj that year, only because the Prophet Wasallam was going for Hajj. And there's a quick comparison with uh, Tabuk. When the Prophet marched to Tabuk, uh, there were 30,000 uh, Sahaba with him. 30,000. Of course, uh, that is not all the Muslims. There were Muslims uh, remaining in Medina uh, and perhaps uh, among the other tribes. Uh, but uh, this is a large amount, uh, unpre unprecedented uh, in the Arabian Peninsula. But uh, just a short while after that, uh, for this Hajj in the 10th year of the Hijra, at least 100,000 people coming to it. Now this, uh, we know, is the only Hajj of the Prophet wasallam. you know, after the Hijra, that is, after his Hijra to Medina. Uh, did he make Hajj before that? Uh, he must have done. Uh, but we don't have reports of that because those who are not uh, uh, the Hajj uh, in which, uh, you know, he laid down laws uh, for people to follow. Uh, uh, it is only in this Hajj uh, that he said, take from me uh, your rites and rituals of the Hajj. You see what I'm doing and do the same in order to complete your Hajj, in order to do it in a proper way, follow what I am doing. Uh, that is the proper way to perform Hajj. Uh, so uh, we get all of the teachings concerning the Hajj uh, and a lot concerning the Umrah uh, in uh, that Hajj of the Prophet wasallam, the farewell Hajj. You know, details of it are reported and we're not going into details of it. Uh, it is not important now for, for us to discuss those details. It is important for us to know those details if possible, if we are going for Hajj or Umrah. Uh, it is, uh, uh, even if you went already, even if you know, uh, you know, you have uh, learned uh, those details, it is always good to refresh your mind, your, your, your heart, your mind, your, your, your memory about the details of it if you're going for Hajj or Umrah. So that is the time, especially, you know, when it becomes important. Um, but not only then, of course, we should know uh, the major things uh, concerning what to do in the Hajj, uh, because it is one of the pillars of Islam. Uh, and so we should not just know that there is a pillar of Islam that is called Hajj. Uh, we should know uh, many of the major details about it that should be there uh, with our lives, you know, in all of uh, all of our lives. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, uh, those details were learned uh, from. what the Prophet Sallallahu did is now completed uh, with the completion of the Hajj of the Prophet Sallallahu uh, And while uh, they are standing on Arafat, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala reveals uh, some verses from Surah Al-Ma'idah. Uh, usually they say Surah Al-Ma'idah is revealed then, but I, uh, again, it's a longish uh, surah. Uh, and all of it is perhaps not revealed at one time, but revealed at different times. Uh, perhaps a lot of it revealed before uh, that final Hajj of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. In this uh, uh, surah, Surah Al-Ma'idah, Allah says, اليوم أكملت لكم دينكم وأدممت عليكم نعمتي ورضيت لكم الإسلام دينا This day have I perfected for you your religion and completed upon you my favor and chosen for you Islam as your religion. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala declares the completion of the deen uh, at that, uh, on Mount Arafat, you know, on the day of Arafat, in the final Hajj of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Here, years later, when Omar radiallahu anhu, who was the Khalifa, a Jew uh, meets him and says, you have uh, in your book a verse. If that were revealed to us Jews, we would take that day in which it was revealed 
you know, as a day of celebration, a very auspicious occasion, a day for us to rejoice in, and so on. And he mentions this verse, And Omar radiallahu anhu says, you know, I know uh, which day uh, and on what occasion that verse was revealed when the Prophet sallallahu was making hajj and he was on Mount Arafat. And of course, uh, that is... <clears throat> Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala already made that a holiday for us, a day of remembrance, an auspicious day, uh, one of the most important days of the year, right? So uh, this Jew was perhaps thinking that uh, we, you know, we have that verse, but we just passed it and did nothing about the day or so. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala declares that as, as a very, very important day for us. Now, what happens when you reach perfection? Uh, the decline starts. And so just bear that in mind. Um, so this is the Hajjatul Wida. The Prophet Sallallahu comes back uh, from the Hajj. Uh, what does he do? Uh, and by the way, uh, uh, let me mention uh, concerning the Hajj. You know, this, uh, the detailed teachings that he gave, uh, there are three uh, three times that he gave a khutbah during that hajj. Not once, but three times he delivered a khutbah in that hajj. Uh, and he explained to them, to the sahaba, uh, all of the teachings of, uh, of Islam, all of the important teachings, uh, all of the things that they need to bear in mind, all of the things that they need to have in the, uh, in, in their hearts as they go ahead with Islam. Uh, and he perhaps, of course, knew that his time was coming to an end. Uh, they will have to proceed without him. Uh, and there are certain uh, deep teachings that they have to have within them. And they have to have a certain discipline, a certain type of training, and so on. The Prophet said and tried to impart uh, to them you know, as much as he could within that time. Short period of time, the Hajj just lasts for a couple of days. Uh, but within that time, you know, he explained everything of importance that they needed to keep in mind. And those who were maybe hearing him for the first time, coming to Hajj for the first time, uh, uh, maybe they had a very short time, you know, before that, you know, as Muslims, uh, they're hearing all of these things and all of them are getting that kind of discipline and training and so on. Uh, so that Hajj is extremely important, including everything that the Prophet Sallallahu said and did there. And we don't have the time to go into all of uh, those uh, details. Uh, but you can understand, you know, I just wanted to impress upon you the importance of that Hajj. Uh, the detailed teaching concerning Islam and concerning how even the Islamic State uh, should be run, uh, what is the purpose and the mission of uh, the Islamic State and uh, Muslims on the whole, everything uh, being condensed there in those few days. So there's a clear explanation uh, of the foundations of Islam on which the Ummah is built, the purpose and the explanation of the purpose of the Ummah, the mission that they have, etc. Uh, what are the things that they need to hold on to in order to keep themselves strong uh, and to be able to fulfill their mission and so on? The Prophet ﷺ did not leave anything unturned. You know, when he finished, he said, uh, you know, Allah al balagd. Uh, have I, you know, conveyed the message? Uh, and when they said yes, the Sahab, you know, all of them, you know, in, in that gathering said yes, you have conveyed the message. He said, Allahumma, you know, he pointed upwards, Allahumma fashad, O oh Allah, bear witness. Uh, so, you know, we. We cannot uh, overemphasize uh, the importance of the Hajj and all of the teachings uh, that come from it. Uh, and perhaps 
the, because of the deviation from those teachings. We find uh, the Ummah in a lot of problems uh, today. You know, many of us have forgotten. Uh, we never learned uh, who we are as Muslims. What do we stand for? Uh, what uh, are our strengths? What are the things that we have to uphold, etc.? You know, uh, and then historians, when they look at, at this, you will find a number of um, the Muslim historians trying to put together the uh, khutbah that the Prophet wasallam gave. Uh, it is not one khutbah, and perhaps, uh, you know, what, uh, what they were thinking of is that he gave a khutbah on uh, Mount Arafat. Uh, you know, on the day of Arafat, he gave a khutbah there. Uh, and this is not all of it reported at once, uh, reported uh, in pieces. Uh, so they need to put all of it together to make up the khutbah that the Prophet ﷺ gave uh, on that occasion. Uh, and what they may be mistaken about is that uh, they were thinking that it is one khutbah, uh, but it is not one khutbah. It is at least on three different occasions in Hajj. Uh, that the Prophet Sallallahu delivered khutbahs. And maybe throughout the Hajj, of course, he is advising. Uh, and some of the quick points that we learn from, you know, all of what he said and what, all of what he did during that Hajj. Uh, we learn that the Quran and Sunnah, these are the foundations of Islam. These are the constitution of the Ummah. Uh, if we abide by them, we will never go astray. The, there's the emphasis on the unity of Muslims. Do not turn your backs on Islam, and you know, and you know, uh, 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 do not turn your backs on each other and you know, start fighting each other, and so on and so forth. Uh, we learn uh, uh, you know, the, the, the thing that uh, brings unity to Muslims is the agreement on uh, the deen, uh, agreement on the aqidah. There is nothing else, no tribe, uh, no race, no nationality, anything else. Uh, uh, that is the real uh, source of unity for Muslims. Uh, it is the deen and the aqidah. Uh, and Muslims need to forego, forego everything else in order to come together and be united. The Muslims are brothers with each other. This is emphasized in the Malmu'minun Ikhwa. Uh, and in the you know in uh, one or more of these sometimes a lot of things he repeated also in the very on the in the various khutbas because a lot of these things are worthy of repeating these teachings. He said, "O people, your Lord is one. Your Father, that is Adam alayhi salam, is one. Uh, we are all descended from the same individual. There is no distinction between Arabs over non-Arabs uh, or non-Arabs over Arabs." Uh, or the red over the black, and you know, the, some of it reported like that, uh, or the, the white over the black, or the, uh, the black over the white, or the black over the red, and so on, except by taqwa. So the emphasis on taqwa, uh, this is what distinguishes uh, one individual from another. And taqwa, of course, uh, is taqwa. He emphasized also justice. There should be no favoritism. Justice should be applied equally to everyone. Uh, no favoritism, no distinctions, no divisions, and so on. Uh, so and he emphasized the uh, correct uh, treat treatment of women, just again, just with justice, treating them with justice and with kindness, and so on. Uh, justice and kindness, uh, they're overlapping, but not exactly the same. So justice and kindness has to be applied uh, uh, and they must be given all of their rights, etc. Uh, so those of us, you know, who are confused about, uh, you know, uh, the slogans that are there today, you know, women's rights and so on and so forth, right? Uh, we need to go back to what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in terms of the rights of women and how uh, they should be treated and uh, how they themselves uh, should uh, should live uh, you know, and how they should observe the treat uh, the, um, the 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 teachings of Islam. 
uh, the Prophet also emphasized uh, that we should beware of sins. Uh, we should beware of the traps of shaitan and falling into, into his traps, into committing sins and so on. And he said that shaitan has become frustrated of ever being worshipped uh, in the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, but he still tries to create divisions among you he, and conflicts and so on. Uh, he still hopes that he can achieve that. Uh, so you're casting your mind over the condition of the Ummah today, uh, the kind of conflicts that we're in uh, to the extent that you know, a section of the uh, of the Muslims uh, uh, under such a great pressure, being being oppressed, uh, being attacked, uh, being you know, possibility of them being completely wiped out and so on. Yet uh, there is no help, no support coming to them from any of the other Muslim countries or Muslim groups that are in a position to be able to help them. There is no help that is coming to them. Uh, uh, the Prophet وسلم, emphasized that riba is haram, and he mentioned also, you know, the first riba that he is going to demolish is the riba of uh, his uncle Abbas. You know, the, what was due to him. No, that should not be taken. Uh, he uh, must uh, forego that. You know, and things uh, like that he mentioned. And also he mentioned about uh, you know the blood feuds, you know, the rivalry that was there, there between tribes and between individuals, you know, in a constant uh, shed, shedding of blood because of these rivalries. And he says that the first uh, blood, uh, blood rivalry that he puts aside uh, that he will uh, he will not follow up. One of his relatives um, uh, apparently uh, was, uh, or some of his relatives uh, who were involved in that, and he said this has to come to an end. Uh, this will not continue anymore. Uh, so the blood fluids are all to be stopped. Riba is to be stopped. Blood fluids are to be stopped. And he establishes the principle of ease uh, in the deen. ad deen yusr uh, The deen, the religion of Islam is ease. Uh, uh, he made the hajj easy for everyone. You know, there are people who are coming there, perhaps elders, uh, you know, people who can, uh, even if they're not elders, maybe they can very, be, very easily be confused. And when you're in such a large gathering uh, with many people, uh, we see that happening uh, in the Hajj or even in Umrah. Sometimes people becoming so confused, uh, they don't know what to do. They don't know what, how to start. They don't know even how to put on the ihram and so on and so forth. Uh, all sorts of confusion. Um, uh, people who think that they can just uh, uh, maybe attend a few sessions, uh, you know, seminars uh, about Hajj, and they will uh, recall everything and they'll be. Able uh, to do the, the Hajj and the Umrah in a proper way and so on. But when they uh, actually arrive there, uh, they become so confused. Uh, so people do things, uh, mix up things. Uh, uh, so people were coming to the Prophet wasallam and saying, you know, I did this before that, I did this before that, I did this before that, and so on. And he was saying to them, La Haraj. Uh, no harm, no problem, no, 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 no problem. Continue, you know, continue. There, there is no harm. Uh, that you, when, uh, uh, some of the things that you make, so maybe in ma making the sacrifice before shaving your hair, your hair, uh, oh, sorry, uh, vice versa, shaving your hair before making the the sacrifice, uh, doing this before that, and so on, uh, which uh, you know people easily get mixed up about, you know, pelting the jamarat before doing such and such, or vice versa. Um, the Prophet was saying to them, uh, no problem, no problem, you know, uh, and allowing them uh, to go ahead, you know, so say they don't have to repeat any of the things that they did. They don't have to make a sacrifice because of a mistake that they committed and so on. <clears throat> One of the other things that we learn in, uh, from the, his Hajj is that we must hear and obey the leader 
uh, the Amir as long as he obeys Allah and his messenger. And here, you know, there's a misconception that people have uh, uh, and something that is being pushed uh, in many countries, <coughs> Muslim countries, hear and obey the leader, uh, full stop. They stop there. But that is not right. Hear and obey the leader as long as he is obeying Allah and his messenger. That's how it should be. He must be obedient to Allah and his messenger. Otherwise, there is no obedience that is due to him. In fact, such a person needs to come under Islamic law. She needs to submit to Islamic law. He is not above Islamic law. Whatever crimes he commits, whatever wrongs he commits, whatever sins he commits and so on, he is held uh, responsible for them. He is uh, punishable for them if there is punishment for any of the things that he violates in Islamic law. Now, he, he should be brought to justice. And, you know, submit to Islamic law, he can be removed. There are those who have been saying that the leader of the Muslims cannot be removed, and this is not right. There is no favoritism in applying the law, so even the leader is subject to, to the law, to justice. Uh, one of the responsibilities of the Islamic State is to ensure that people know Islam and they are practicing it correctly and so on. It is to enable them to go to Jannah. The state must be helping them to go to Jannah. And so they must understand uh, their responsibilities. The state must help them to do that. The state must help them to realize uh, their aim. Uh, if they don't recognize their aim, they need to realize it. They need to recognize it, that our aim is to go to Jannah, paradise, uh, you know, the, and there's nothing less uh, that we'll settle for. Uh, we must also understand that we have to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this the Prophet has and I emphasized. The meeting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is inevitable. No escaping that. So make sure that you are in a position to meet him. Uh, that you that you will want to meet him. Uh, not that you will try to, you know, uh, escape meeting him, escape the judgment. You can't, of course, escape any of that. Um, <clears throat> so don't even attempt to do that. But you should attempt, uh, you should try your level best uh, to develop yourself to the extent that uh, you will be pleased to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be pleased to meet you. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there's a hadith that says, uh, whoever is pleased to meet their Lord, their Lord is pleased to meet with them. Whoever does not like or dislikes uh, to meet their Lord, their Lord will dislike to meet them. But of course, uh, meeting him is inevitable. So either it will be a good meeting or it will uh, be miserable for some people. So after that, the Prophet ﷺ returns to Medina. And he begins the preparation of the army of Osama. He begins the preparation of an army and he puts Osama ibn Zaid uh, to lead that army. Osama is only 18 years old. And this army comprised of many senior Sahaba who were experienced uh, in the battlefield. Abu Bakr, Omar, and others like them were in the army. Uh, what was the reason for this army, for the preparation of this army? Because the news came to the Prophet wasallam that the Byzantine Empire was again making preparations to invade. Uh, and of course, the Prophet ﷺ would not allow the enemy to come and attack, uh, you know, as much as he could avoid that. He would, uh, you know, head with his army before they come and confront them in their territory if possible. You know, we saw that on many occasions in the, you know, in the past, you know, uh, uh, conflicts, uh, 
uh, within within the Sira. Uh, this is what he did. So he prepared that army, put Osama ibn Zayd as the head, and this is in year Safar uh, in uh, in Safar of the year eleven. So the tenth year is over, and there we are in the eleventh year of the Hijrah. In Safar, this army uh, is sent out. Uh, this would be the third uh, confrontation with the Byzantine Empire. What were the two uh, before this? The Battle of Mu'ta, if you recall, in which uh, the Prophet had appointed uh, three leaders. Uh, and there is the uh, Battle of uh, Tabuk, uh, which uh, the Byzantines refrained uh, from uh, coming to. They refrain from confront confrontation with the Muslims. Now, Osama was, of course, very qualified. The Prophet would not appoint someone who is not qualified uh, to be in that position, to be the leader of an army, an army general, and to lead them into battle and so on. Uh, but because of his young age, there are people who were not uh, comfortable with him. And they started to say things and, you know, complain about him and so on until they complained to reach the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which he addressed uh, uh, and during his sickness, uh, before his death, he addressed that matter. And he said, you know, I hear complaints about Usama, uh, just as there were complaints about his uh, father before him, that is Zaid. Uh, but you know he is uh, fit to do do the job and so on. So uh, the, this army has to proceed. Now the army leaves Medina and they're on their way to Sham. Uh, I mean, you you know by now you should know that Sham. Uh, uh, these days the word Sham is used mainly for Syria, the country of Syria. <coughs> But originally, it meant a, a much wider area than that, right? It it uh, consisted of uh, Syria, uh, Palestine, all of Palestine, with uh, you know even including those parts that uh, are called Israel today, Lebanon, uh, Jordan, all of this around all of those areas, uh, uh, Sham. Uh, so the army goes out uh, towards the Sham, but then they get the news of the sickness of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So they stop and they wait. They wait to hear the good news of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and in his instructions on what they should do, uh, when they should carry on and so on. So. Now in Early Safar, uh, we said that Safar in Safar, um, this army was sent out. Also in Safar, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, so we're coming, uh, you know, to the last, the final days of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Uh, so in Safar of the year 11, he goes to Ahad, where he <coughs> makes Salah and dua for the martyrs. We know those who were martyred in the Battle of Ahad, and they were buried there. And he bids them farewell. We are going to reach you soon. That's what he said. Uh, he returns to Medina. Now he stands on the member, and he delivers a khutbah. And he advises the people I am preceding you. He said, you know, I am preceding you. I'm a witness over you. I'm seeing my howth now. You know, the howth is that pond or river of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Jannah. And all of the Ummah will go to it and they will have a sip of water from it. And the water is... a uh, you know, sweeter than honey and so on. Uh, the, uh, it is, uh, I think, uh, there's a description of it being whiter than milk. Or... 
uh, sweeter than honey and so on, and anybody who drinks from it uh, will never uh, be thirsty again. So the Ummah. of the Prophet وسلم, will be drinking. He is the one who will be there receiving all of them and he will be uh, giving them uh, the water to drink uh, from this uh, pond or this river. Kawthar, Al-Kawthar. Uh, he says to them also in this khutbah, so he's seeing that, he says, I'm seeing that, I'm seeing that now. Uh, he says also, I have been granted the keys of the earth, the treasures of the earth. I have been granted the keys of the treasures of the earth. I'm not afraid that you will fall into shirk. And he's speaking, of course, to the multitude of people. I'm not afraid that you will fall into shirk after me. I'm afraid that you will fight one another over the dunya, over the treasures of the earth. You will fight one another kill one another, etc. You know, and he said things like that. Again, all of these are reminders of what we should do and what we should, we should not do. Uh, reminders about the brotherhood of the believers and the way that they should cooperate with each other, the way in which they, they should be supportive of each other and, you know, cooperate for the God of Islam to fulfill their mission. Now, close to the end of the month of Safar, uh, he and one of his servants by the name of Abu Muwaihiba, Abu Muwaihiba, they go together. You know, he invites Abu Muwaihiba to go with him and they go together to uh, Jannatul Baqiya. Uh, Baq Al Baqiya uh, is the graveyard of, in Medina, and this is where the Sahaba uh, and people who die in Medina are buried. So Abu Mu, Mu, uh, Al Muwaihiba, you know, he narrates uh, what happens. He goes with the Prophet Sallallahu The Prophet Sallallahu stands among the graves and he says, Assalamu Alaikum, uh, O occupants of the, of the grave, of the graves. You know, he addresses them. He says, uh, and one of the things that he says to them is what you are, what you are in, what you are experiencing now, the situation that you are in is better than what the living are in and what they are going to experience, what is going to happen to them. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had mentioned to him the things that are going to happen to this ummah, all of the fitan uh, that will befall them. He says, what is going to happen to them? You, the occupants of the graves, are in a better position than they are. And if you only knew what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has saved you from. The fitan, uh, these trials and tribulations, are approaching like pieces of the dark night. They're falling, they're falling like, you know, dark night, as if pieces of the dark night are falling. And the later ones will be worse than the former ones. The earlier ones, the later ones will be worse than the earlier ones. So every time a new fit happens, it is worse than the previous ones. We can ask ourselves, you know, is this what is happening today to us? You know, it seems so. <laughs> he says, oh, Abu Muwaihiba. I'm given the keys to the treasures of the dunya. Uh, and I have been given the choice to remain in this dunya and then Jannah or uh, to meet my Lord and Jannah. There is immediately going to him soon, very soon, you know, uh, uh, and going to Jannah. So Abu uh, Muayhiba says, Ya Rasulullah, take the keys of the dunya and remain in it, on, uh, and then eventually Jannah will be yours. Uh, but the Prophet ﷺ said to him, No, I have chosen my Lord. 
I've chosen to be with my Lord, not to remain in the dunya. So then he makes uh, istighfar, he asks for forgiveness uh, for the occupants of the graveyard, uh, Jannatun Baqiyah. And he says to them, I will be with you soon. So this is uh, almost the same message that he gave uh, a little earlier uh, to those who uh, are alive, right? Those who are alive uh, in, in a khutbah that he was delivering to them. So then he goes home from uh, Baqiyah. On the 29th of Safar, he attended a janazah in al Baqiyah. And when he returned, he started to feel sick. Now, the sickness in which he died now starts, you know, 29th of Safar. But this is you know, perhaps one of the most difficult parts of the seerah to talk about. Uh, very, very emotional. Uh, no matter how much you speak about it, you know, it is still emotional. Uh, you know, any speaker, any uh, one who uh, you know get the, who speaks on, on the Sira and speaks about this part and so on will tell you that. Right? He becomes you know, emotional about it. So the sickness of the Prophet Adam starts on the 29th of Safar. It was a Monday, exactly two weeks uh, before his death. He started to have a severe headache. Uh, very, very intense. And then the fever also started, and that also became very, very intense. He tied a band uh, around his head, you know, because of the headache. Uh, and some of the Sahaba who said they felt, uh, you know, his uh, head, you know, uh, they, they put his hand on that band, you know, that was wrapped around his head. They could feel the fever in, through it. Aisha radiallahu anha, she happened to have a headache at the same time and she started to say, Wa ra'sa, wa ra'sa, oh my head, you know, oh my head. Something like that, you know, how we would say it, how we would say it in English. My head is paining. Uh, and he said to her, no, uh, it is me, uh, wa ra'sa. I should be the one who is saying, wa ra'sa. Wa ra'sa, you know, oh my head. Uh, and uh, this is perhaps the first time that he does not respond to Aisha radiallahu and her when she is sick. He doesn't pay attention to her sickness. You know, usually he would. Also, this is perhaps the first time that he complains of a sickness of his own. When uh, in the Sira, uh, do we find him complaining of being sick, you know, headaches or anything like that? You know, I can't recall any time when that happened, right? When he complained of sickness. So the sickness becomes worse, the fever, the headache, etc. You know, and this caused him to lose consciousness also a lot. And then, you know, he, he is drifting in and out of consciousness and he is saying, where am I tomorrow? Where am I tomorrow? Meaning to say that uh, when is the turn of Aisha? Yeah. Coming, when is her turn coming? Because of course, every day he would be with uh, a different wife. So where am I tomorrow? When is the turn of Aisha radiallahu anha coming? He doesn't say that plainly. You know, he doesn't perhaps want to, uh, you know, say anything to upset uh, his wives. But they understood eventually, and they gave consent to him uh, for him to stay with her in her home uh, during the sickness. 
So he remains in her home uh, from the fifth of Rabi al Awal. Uh, fifth uh, Rabi al Awal five. Uh, he is in her home from then, uh, you know, until he dies. And that is exactly one week. Now, this is the last week. Uh, and it was almost impossible for him to walk. Two of the Sahaba had to hold him up. And these were the ones who were cl closely related to him. Al-Fadl uh, ibn Abbas, the son uh, of Abbas, who, of course, is his cousin. Uh, Al-Fadl is his cousin. Abbas is his uncle. And Ali, radiallahu anhu. Radiallahu anhu, all of them, because all of them are believers, right? Uh, we know Ali. Al Fadl, uh, another cousin of the Prophet. So the two of them had to be holding up, uh, him up, and his feet would be dragging on the ground. He couldn't walk. His head was tied, and he spoke with difficulty. You know, this is how intense it was. Aisha radiallahu anha said, You know, I never saw a man in such pain as he was. So this statement, you know, you can just uh, imagine the kind of pain that he was going through. Uh, Abdullah bin Masood came to visit him and he saw that he was trembling severely. And he says, Ya Rasulullah, you are trembling very strong, right? Very strongly, very severely. He says, yes, I tremble as two men would tremble. Or, I, you know, I'm feeling that fever and trembling and so on, as much as two men would feel. So it was so intense, uh, double the amount of ordinary men. The Prophet also said, you know, any Muslim who is afflicted by sickness or anything else, afflicted by any other problem issue, Allah removes uh, from him the sins because of these sicknesses, uh, just like the trees shedding their leaves. When autumn comes, when, when fall comes, and the, she, the trees are shedding their leaves, um, this is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala removes the sins of the believers uh, uh, whenever they feel sicknesses, any kind of sickness or any kind of difficulties. <laughs> You no, know, he was feeling so feverish. Uh, he started to say, uh, uh, you know, we can't, of course, uh, describe all the details. Uh, pour, pour water upon me to lessen this fever so that I can go out to meet the people. You know, the masjid is just there. He, he is in the house of Aisha, and her. And as soon as you step out of the door of her house, you go into the masjid. Uh, so... Uh, you know, he wanted to go. He wanted to meet the people. He wanted to perform salah in the masjid, but he couldn't uh, do that. You know, so it would, had become too difficult for him or be, it was becoming so difficult for him. Pour water upon me, you know, lessen the fever so that I can go out to the people. So when they had, you know, thrown enough water, he says, enough, enough. And he tries to, he goes out, you know, uh, on one occasion into the masjid and he ascends the member and the people gather around him and he says to them Allah's curse is on the Jews and the Christians who took the graves of their prophets as masjid, as masjids. So of course this is a reminder for us uh, what not to do. They took the, uh, their, uh, the, the graves of their prophets as masjids, and so the course of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is on them. There's also an occasion, uh, or maybe one okay, more than one occasion, uh, when he says to, to them, uh, do not make my grave a place of worship, a masjid. Do not make my grave a masjid. He also said to them, uh, do not 
exalt me as the Christians exalted Isa alayhi salam. Uh, do not put me on such a high pedestal as uh, the Christians have put uh, Isa alayhi salam. So there are many different ways in which he warned them, uh, you know, of committing shirk and making him, exalting him over his level and making him almost like a god with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and so on. Uh, so we can see throughout whether it is Hajjat al Wada or even during his sickness that he was very, very conscious of this. Uh, and uh, he wanted to make sure that the, 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 uh, not only the Sahaba, but all of his ummah absolutely understand this point and that they would not go into any form of shirk whatsoever. Then uh, on one occasion, uh, he uh, could be on the same occasion, he presented himself for retaliation. He said, if I, you know, did any wrong to anyone, I hit anyone or so, then here, here's my back. You can take your retaliation for that. You know, I saw in some sources that uh, I wasn't able to check it back, uh, you know, recently, so I'm not sure of the authenticity of it, but uh, one of the Sahaba came forward and said, you know, you... Um, you hit me with the stick that you had. You had you know, the processor. You would very often have a stick that, you know, he would be giving instructions using that. You hit me with your stick. Uh, I want my revenge for that. My ret retaliation. Uh, the the prophet Sallam said, "Okay, um, here's my back," uh, or. If I recall uh, properly, here's my, you know, belly, my chest, my stomach. Uh, and this Sahabi uh, held on to the Prophet Sallam and kissed him, kissed his back or his stomach, whichever uh, it was. Uh, so, you know, this is showing love for the Prophet Sallam, you know, that he wanted revenge, he wanted to use the opportunity uh, to hug uh, the Prophet وسلم, and kiss him and so on. Uh, he also, you know, said that if uh, I owe anybody anything, money, if I owe money to anyone, you know, property, I taking somebody's property or so, uh, let me know. I will repay it. I want all of these things to be settled, you know, before I die. Uh, so it is reported again that one of the Sahaba uh, said, uh, you owe me uh, three dirhams. And dirham is the smaller coin, not, not the more, uh, no, no, dinar is the more expensive one. And the dirham is the smaller coin. So you, say, you owe me uh, three dirhams. And the Prophet ﷺ ordered Al-Fadl, uh, his cousin, uh, to go get it uh, and give it uh, to this uh, person. And then when he was asked, this person was asked later on, why did you do that? Who, who would maybe react in, in such a way to the Prophet ﷺ? And he said this, this is because the Prophet ﷺ, you know, said, that uh, you know, he wanted to to absolve himself of all of these situations, you know. So he wanted to ensure that the Prophet Sallam, you know, does not have anything to answer for in front of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. So even this matter is cleared. So not that he wanted the money back, but he wanted uh, to ensure that the Prophet Sallam is getting his wish. Uh, the Prophet also advised them to treat the Ansar kindly. And he spoke, you know, very kindly about the Ansar, very nicely about the Ansar, the importance of the Ansar, the way in which uh, they had supported him, you know, from the very beginning, you know, before uh, his coming to Medina, when they accepted Islam in Mecca and so on. Uh, so he spoke, uh, he spoke, he reminded them about all of these things. And he, he said, you know, his advice is that uh, the Ansar should be treated kindly. 
he spoke of a man uh, whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given the choice uh, to remain in this dunya uh, or to, to, to have what is in this dunya uh, or to have what is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that person chose what is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the Sahaba, uh, and then uh, they reported, uh, those who were reporting this, they said that uh, Abu Bakr wept. When he mentioned this man, the Prophet mentioned this man to whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given the choice, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu wept and said, Fadainaka bi abaina wa ummahatina. We may our parents, our fathers and our mothers uh, be your ransom, you know, messenger of Allah. So, uh, the, and the other Sahaba, the rest of the Sahaba were looking at him and so on. This old man, Abu Bakr, why is he weeping? The Prophet I just mentioned about someone uh, whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave a choice to, to remain in this dunya or to leave, uh, to, to, to go into Jannah. Uh, what uh, only Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu understood at that time was uh, uh, this was a reference to himself. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given him the choice to remain in this dunya, but uh, he declined and he chose to be with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So all of these things were said uh, during uh, that uh, period of, uh, of uh, sickness of the Prophet from the 29th of Safar going onwards. Uh, now on the 8th of uh, Rabi al-Awwal, that is four days before his death, he called for paper and pen to write down a will, to write something uh, for the Sahaba. He said that, you know, he will write something, uh, uh, you know, which if they follow it, they will never go astray. Something that will prevent them from going astray. You know, uh, and uh, then there was an argument. Omar radiallahu anhu apparently said, "You, uh, we we don't need to put the Prophet in distress. This is too difficult for him." You know, they were seeing uh, the difficulty that he was in and so on. He was, you know, hardly, every time he get, he regains consciousness, he would faint again and then regain consciousness and faint again and, and things like that, right? <coughs> do, <coughs> do not put uh, this kind of pressure on him and so on. And so there was an argument uh, among the uh, Sahaba who were there. Some of them wanted to bring that uh, the pen and paper. Some of them, uh, uh, like Omar, uh, did not. Uh, and the Prophet said, said, leave me. You shall not be arguing, you know, in front of me like that. Uh, leave me, go go out. So they left. Uh, now, how important was this thing that the Prophet said wanted to write down or wanted to dictate? You know, if it was so important, the Prophet said, uh, remained uh, alive for another four days. Uh, and if he had wanted, if it was important, if it was something compulsory that they needed to have, uh, that they needed to understand or so, he would have given it to them. He would have told them, he would have he would have had have it uh, written down, but he didn't. You know, he left the matter after this situation happened. Now he gives uh, uh, three commands. Uh, he said, the Mushrikeen must uh, be expelled from Arabia, from the Arabian Peninsula. The delegations must be allowed to visit and they must receive those delegations as he was receiving them. Uh, and the third thing, the narrator, for one of the narrators uh, forgot and others uh, who might have narrated the same thing uh, differ on what the third matter was, but we know the first two. The Mushrikeen must be expelled from the Arabian Peninsula and the delegations uh, must be allowed to visit. Uh, some of them say that uh, his advice was, the third one was in relation to the Quran, hold on to the Quran. Others say that it was concerning the army of Osama. Uh, others uh, said that it was about Salah. 
And of course, uh, we we know the Prophet emphasized, you know, holding on to the Quran, and he also emphasized during, especially during the sickness about salah. He emphasized, he, uh, you know, uh, and it was uh, he did that both by what he said as well, well as what he did. In a practical way, he was trying to he was trying to show them that salah is important. Every time he regained consciousness, uh, he would call for water, make wudu. Uh, an attempt to go out to the masjid to pray salah with the people. Uh, so this happened time uh, over and over. It was happening, uh, but uh, on the uh, 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 on all of these occasions, the Prophet Sallam was too weak uh, uh, to be able to go into the masjid. As soon as he made the attempt to do so, uh, he started to faint again. But he did emphasize uh, the importance of the salah by this means, as well as by uh, what he said. Uh, so, you know, uh, on one occasion, you know, <clears throat> he uh, he had prayed with the Muslims, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, in the masjid. And after Margaret, the entire the entire day, he was uh, he prayed with them, all of the salawat, and then after Maghrib, he goes back home. And the pain becomes very, very intense. He could not even move. And he was semi-conscious. So every time he you know, gain, regains consciousness, he asks, uh, have the people prayed? Asal nas have the people prayed? And he is talking about Isha. And they, they say to him, no, they are waiting for you. So he asks for water. So And he makes ghusl, he makes wudu. And then he attempts to go out to the masjid, but he could not. He faints again. And then when he uh, becomes conscious, he asks again, Asal and Nas, did the people pray? They say, no, they're, they're waiting for you. So he makes an attempt to go into the masjid again. He calls for water, makes an attempt to go to the masjid. He faints again three times. Uh, then only after that, you know, he decides that he, he needs to appoint somebody to lead the salah, and he appoints Abu Bakr, radiallahu anhu. Now Aisha, radiallahu anha, is afraid that Abu Bakr, you know, he, whenever he recites the Quran, he begins to weep. So this would be disturbing for uh, the other people who are praying behind him. Uh, she didn't want that to happen. Uh, so she said, uh, you know, g give it to somebody else. Let somebody else do that. Uh, but the Prophet ﷺ insisted on having Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu lead the salah. Uh, from, so Abu Bakr, uh, he was given the, that, he was not there, he was not present at that time, but he was told about this. And so he, uh, from that time onwards, he started to lead uh, the salah. So this was Thursday, the 8th of Rabi al Awal. Uh, on the 9th of Rabi, Rabi al Awal, this is Friday now, I see some reports that say that the Prophet ﷺ gave the khutbah sitting on the member. So perhaps that is so. And I see uh, some reports saying that Abu Bakr uh, is the one who gave the khutbah on this occasion. <coughs> Uh, <coughs> so I, I I'm not sure which is uh, correct, whether it is Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu who gave the khutbah, or it is the Prophet sallam himself. Uh, so perhaps it was on this occasion that the Prophet sallam you know gave uh, a number of of advices and so on that he mentioned uh, before. And Jabir radiallahu anhu. Uh, says, I heard the Prophet وسلم, say three days before his death, none of you should die except while thinking good of Allah. لَا يَمُوتَنَّ أَحَدُكُمْ إِلَّا وَهُوَ يُحْزِنُ ظَنَّ بِاللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلْ None of you should die except while thinking good of, uh, of Allah. So perhaps it was uh, during the khutbah, Allahu Alam, or maybe uh, not in the khutbah itself, but 
uh, whenever the Prabhupada was able to speak to them, he said that. So that was Friday. <clears throat> then Saturday or Sunday, uh, it is <clears throat> uh, reported, you know, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu is leading Salah. And now he's leading Salat al Dhuhr on that day, which is, which is either Saturday or Sunday. And the Prophet وسلم, comes out, but he's leaning on Abbas and Ali, radiallahu anhuma. He can't walk by himself, he, you know, he's dragging his feet. So they reach, they reach to the first saf while Abu Bakr is leading the salah. Uh, Abu Bakr notices the Prophet وسلم, and he steps back. Uh, which happened on other occasions also. He stepped back uh, so that the Prophet Sallallahu can come forward and lead. But the Prophet Sallallahu signals to him to remain in place. And the Prophet Sallallahu sits on his left side. So the Prophet Sallallahu is leading Abu Bakr, uh, but he's unable to you know, say anything aloud. And Abu Bakr is following him and everybody else is following Abu Bakr. Uh, so this is how uh, the Salah was done. Then after that, on the 11th of the month, so definitely uh, this is uh, on the Sunday, the Prophet وسلم, gives away everything that he had, all his possessions. You know, he had a few slaves, he gave all of them he, their freedom. Uh, he had seven dinars. He gave all of that away. Maybe food, if he had any food, all of it away, excepting very, very little uh, for the family. You know, and there's the report that when the Prophet Sallam died, you know, the wives of the Prophet Sallam did not have uh, anything to eat or much, very, very little. Aisha radiallahu and her reports that she had a barley. I'm not sure if it, if it was you know, like a container of barley or it was a single, you know, barley seed or, or, or whatever. Allahu alam. Very small amount of things that they had. <clears throat> there is a hadith of the Prophet. Uh, I don't know exactly when he said, said it. Uh, but uh, uh, the uh, what is reported in the Sunan of Adarami and perhaps other books of Hadith that the Prophet Sallallahu said, "Ida asaba ahadukum musiba, ida asaba ahadakum musibatun, fal yadkur musabi musabahu bi, fa innaha min a'zam al masaib." When any one of you is afflicted by any calamity. Uh, then let him remember his affliction by me, by my death. When any one of you is afflicted by any calamity, let him remember his affliction by my death, you know, because of my death. It is uh, one of the greatest uh, uh, misfortunes or afflictions or so. One of the worst things that can happen, you know, that could have happened to any believer, you know, the death of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So if, if any uh, affliction happens to, anything bad happens to, just remember the death of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there, there could be nothing worse than that happening to a believer. Anas radiallahu anhu, you know, and he died when? Uh, uh, on the next day, Monday, when the sun sun was fully risen, that is uh, Doha at the time of Doha, when the sun was fully risen, on the morning of Monday, the twelfth of Rabi'ul Awwal, in the year eleven Hijra, Hijri, the Prophet Sallam dies. Anas radiallahu anhu says, "Ma ra'aytu yawman qat." كان أحسن ولا أضواء من يوم من يوم دخل علينا فيه رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وما رأيت يوما كان أقبح ولا أظلم 
من يوم مات فيه رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم. He said, I have never, I have not seen a day that was more bright, uh, more auspicious, more you know beautiful than the day in which the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam entered Medina. And I have not seen a day that was darker, uh, that was worse than the day in which the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam died. You know, the, so this expresses the feeling of all of the Sahaba. The day the Prophet ﷺ entered into Medina was such a joyous occasion for all of the people of Medina. And us, of course, belong to Medina. Uh, and the day that he died was uh, such a bad situation, uh, such a dark day for all of the Sahaba. Uh, but before mentioning the final things, you know, I thought I would have been finished by now, but still there's so many, so many things. Uh, the, uh, this, uh, this again is the final day, the final day on the morning, the Fajr, at the time of Fajr, the Prophet felt a little better. So he came to the door of Aisha radiallahu and her and he moved the curtain and he looked out and he saw the Sahaba praying behind Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. So he was standing, you know, he was strong enough to stand. And the Sahaba, you know, afterwards reported that his face was like the, a page of the Mus'haf. It was so bright and he smiled, the Prophet Sallallahu smiled. Abu Bakr saw the Prophet and stepped back for him to come forward. Uh, but the Prophet signaled for him to remain in place. And Anas radiallahu anhu, who was reporting this, he says, they almost broke their salah out of joy, just seeing the Prophet standing there and his face uh, so bright and so on. Uh, they almost broke their salah out of joy. So they continued with their salah. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam pulled the curtain and went back inside. So you know, that is the last time they saw him alive. The wives of the Prophet ﷺ were with him in his last moments. He called for Fatima radiallahu anha. She came. Uh, he said, Marhaban bibnati. Welcome to my daughter. He sat her down next to him and he whispered to her. And this is when, you know, she burst out crying. Then he whispered to her again and she started to laugh. And Aisha radiallahu and her asked her about this. She said, I will not disclose the secret of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Later on, Aisha, after the death of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi Aisha radiallahu and her asked her again about it. Uh, and she said, okay, now uh, there is no harm in telling you. And she said, when the, uh, on the first occasion, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi said to her, uh, uh, would you not like to be uh, the chief of the women of paradise? Or he said to her, uh, you will be the first out of my family, out of Ahlul Bayt, you know, to, uh, to come after me. You will be the first to die after me. So whichever it is that he said, maybe he said both that she will be the chief of the women of paradise or, or the, the believers, the believing women, uh, and uh, that she will be the first of his uh, Ahlul Bayt you know, to follow him. Uh, <clears throat> so she laughed uh, uh, you know, with that good news. That was good news for her. <laughs> uh, 
the suffering of the Prophet was so distressing for her. And he says to her, Laisa ala abiki, you know, she was saying, Wa karba aba, wa karba aba, aba, abi, abi, or aba. You know, how, um, how great is the suffering or oh, the suffering of my father, the suffering of my father, something to that effect, right? So she, he says to her, Laisa ala abiki karbun ba'd al yawm. There will be no suffering for your father after this day. No suffering, no pain for your father after this day. Uh, there's a, 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 another thing that he said, up to his dying moment, perhaps up to his last breath, you know, he said he gives advice to his ummah. As salat as salah. Wa ma malakat aymanukum. Salah salah. Hold on to salah. Uh, make sure you establish your salah. Uh, and the other advice, two advices. So the second advice uh, in, in relation to what you own, uh, the, the, the slaves that you own. In other words, be good to them. The slave, the, those that your right hands possess. Salah and what your right hands possess. Salah and what your right hands possess. And he kept repeating this uh, to the extent that he, you know it was coming from his chest and not coming from his mouth anymore. Uh, the repetition of this: as Salah, as Salah, wa ma malakat aymanukum. Salah and what your right hands possess. So this is how much he emphasized Salah uh, and the good treatment of slaves and even the freeing of slaves and so on. And he kept dipping his hand in water. There's a bowl of water next to him. He kept dipping his hand in that. And he's wiping his face with that water because of the, the heat, the fever. And he says, La ilaha illallah, inna lil mawti sakarat. La ilaha illallah, inna lil mawti sakarat. Uh, we all know La ilaha illallah. The, the second part is, you know, the, the death has its pangs. Uh, it's pains, it's, you know, suffering, it's difficulties. Inna lil mawti sakarat, inna lil mawti sakarat. There are the pangs of death, there are the pangs of death. The pains, the difficulties of death, right? So even the Prophet ﷺ had to go through that. Uh, human beings are generally not uh, uh, exempted from that. So even the Prophet ﷺ went through the pangs of death. Uh, and he was, uh, there's another way in which it is reported. He is saying, Allahumma a'inni ala sakaratil maut. O oh Allah, help me over the pangs of death. O oh Allah, help me over the pangs of death. Allahumma a'inni ala sakaratil maut. So he dies. Aisha radiallahu anha says, you know, among the blessings uh, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has bestowed upon me uh, is that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam died in my house on my day, the day that is my day, and between my neck and my navel, you know, in my lap. You know, his head is in my lap, between my neck and my navel. Uh, and also Allah mixed our saliva, made our saliva mix at his death. Uh, in order, uh, and she explains uh, what that means. She said that his head was in my lap. Abdul Rahman, her brother, the son of Abu Bakr, Abdul Rahman, entered and he had a miswak uh, in his hand, a toothbrush in his hand. The Prophet وسلم, stared at it, and she re she re she uh, recognized that he wanted it. So she asked him, do you want me to uh, bring it to you? She, he said, he signaled, yes, he couldn't talk. <clears throat> so she gave it to him, but it was hard. She asked him if he wanted her to soften it. You know, the miswak, of course, these are uh, the twig, a twig from a tree. He signaled, yes. Uh, so she did that. She chewed it and she gave it to him. So this is how uh, her saliva and his saliva mixed.
as soon as he finished brushing his teeth, you know, he raised his hand or his finger and he started staring at the ceiling and his lips moved. And Aisha radiallahu anha listened closely and he was saying, Ma'alladina an amta alayhim min an nabiyina wa siddiqina wa shuhadai wa salihin with those whom you have blessed from the prophets, uh, the siddiqin, the righteous and you know, the truthful people, wa shuhada and the martyrs wa salihin, uh, the righteous ones, the righteous people. Allahumma aghfir li wa arhamni wa alhiqni bi rafiq al a'la. O oh Allah, forgive me, have mercy upon me, uh, and join me uh, with uh, the companion on high, the highest companion. Uh, perhaps the highest companion uh, is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself. Allahumma ar rafiq al a'la. O oh Allah, the highest uh, companion, the companion on high. So this part, you know, he was repeating, he repeated several times. Then his hand dropped and his soul departed. <clears throat> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Zumar, إِنَّكَ مَيَّتُمْ وَإِنَّهُمْ مَيَّتُونَ You, about the Prophet and to the Prophet you will be dead and the people will die. You will die and the people will die. All of them will die. So there's no, you know, escaping that. The uh, and the last thing uh, uh, actually <laughs> again look there's still a few a few more things <clears throat> you know the uh, uh, the hadith that I mentioned before the biggest misfortune that any believer can face <laughs> any Muslim is the death of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You know, this is the worst thing that happened to the Ummah, the entire Ummah, and that happens to every believer. So if you ever, if you, you know, ever, you know, passing through any difficult situation, any misfortune, any calamity or so, remember the death of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But perhaps the worst thing in the death of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, scholars have said, is that this means the end of revelation. Before that revelation was coming, giving guidance, you know, correcting the believers, uh, there are so many benefits that we were getting from revelation. It was always coming, you know, and the Sahaba grew so accustomed to it and so on, and they knew that every time Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was going to send them a revelation to give guidance in any situation that was proving difficult to them. Yeah, any situation, if they even made a mistake and so on, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would correct it. Uh, so they expected that to continue. Maybe the Prophet would, you know, would be with them forever, would be with the Ummah forever. Revelation will continue forever. And so on. But no, this, uh, the death of the Prophet means that revelation has stopped. So the Ummah has to proceed you know, without that guidance anymore. Whatever has been revealed up to this time, that is what will remain with us, and that is what we have to follow. All of the guidance that we need is there uh, in it, uh, and in the Sunnah of the Prophet Wasallam, we have to study these sources carefully. We have to try to understand them deeply, and we have to be able to put them together, put two and two together, and so on. Every situation that confronts us, there is nothing that will happen uh, uh, until Yom Al-Qiyamah, except that there is guidance concerning it in the Sunnah and the Quran, in the Quran and Sunnah. Of the process, and this is something that we have to have very firm in our hearts, and we have to know uh, this is the reality. These are the sources that we have to check. Revelation is not continuing. Don't expect anybody to be inspired again uh, in that way. That will be guidance for us. Uh, uh, difficult situations will occur, uh, but we have the sources uh, to uh, uh, understand what to do, what we need to do. Now, after his death, uh, then we mention again, and hopefully uh, uh, this will be the last few things uh, to say. Uh, the Sahaba were dumbfounded when they heard of the death of the Prophet Wasallam. 
and the impact of his death was tremendous upon them. So much so that some of them stopped thinking. <laughs> at least for the moment, you know, for they couldn't think of at all. Is you know, it was such a great shock to them. Some of them sat down. They were standing. They the the they sat down. Maybe those who were sitting could not even could could not stand up again. Their feet, their their legs could not take the, their weight anymore. Some of them fell silent and they could not speak. There's nothing that, that could come through their mind that they could speak or say at all. And some of them apparently could not believe the news also. Uh, you know, Abu Bakr was not present when the Prophet Wasallam died and the news of his death started to spread those who were there. Omar radiallahu and who he came uh, and he started to deny the death of the Prophet Wasallam. He said that uh, he is not dead, but he is away. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taken him away just as he had taken Musa salam away for 40 days and he will come back and he will deal with those people who say that he is dead. He will cut off the, the limbs of their body. He will cut off their hands and feet and so on. And Omar was saying a lot of uh, what we can say nonsense, a lot of things like this. Uh, so the news uh, was was sent uh, to Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, and he came very quickly. Actually, uh, what I forgot to mention was that in the morning that uh, the you know, Fajr, uh, when they thought that the Prophet was better. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu who had asked his permission to leave and to go to visit his family who was uh, a little far away. So Abu Bakr had gone. Now he hears the news, he comes back. The Muslims are hoping that Omar radiallahu anhu is correct, that the Prophet is not dead. Uh, but nobody is saying anything except, except Omar radiallahu anhu. So Abu Bakr comes in, he sees Omar radiallahu anhu, but he goes straight uh, to the room of Aisha, uh, the Prophet is lying on his bed. He is covered. Uh, he lifts uh, the cover uh, from the face of the Prophet وسلم, and he recognizes that the Prophet is dead. So Abu Bakr begins to weep. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants him extraordinary strength. His reaction was not like the reaction of any of the other Sahaba. He kisses the forehead of the Prophet وسلم, and then he says, Be abi anta wa ummi, may my father and brother, father and mother be your sacrifice. Tibta hayyan wa mayyutan. You are you know, so wonderful, you are so good living and dead, in life and in death. You are so wonderful. You are so maybe handsome or wonderful, beautiful, and so in, in life and in death. وَالَّذِي نَفْسِي بِيَدِهِ لَا يُذِيقُكَ اللَّهُ الْمَوْتَتَيْنِ أَبَدًا By him in whose hand is my life, Allah will not cause you to taste death twice. Twice. As for the death that was written for you to have, you have gotten that. So Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu was very sober-minded, uh, seeing the Prophet Adam dead, and he said these things, which would have an impact also on the Sahaba. They are hearing him saying these things, you are dead. The Prophet وسلم, is dead, you know, uh, and... Uh, you will not die a second time. This is the only time that you will die. So he hurries out now to calm the people down. He finds Omar radiallahu an who is saying all the things that he was saying and swearing that the Prophet sallallahu is not dead. And he says to Omar, calm down, sit down. Sit down, calm down. Uh, but Omar did not listen to him. Omar continued to speak. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu steps aside from him and starts to speak to the people. 
uh, they all they leave Omar and they now listen to Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, and he delivers a khutbah, one of the most effective khutbahs that the world has ever heard. And by it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala stabilizes the entire ummah. Uh, he praises Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, just as how we would start any khutbah with the praise of Allah. And then he says, uh, Man kana ya'budu Muhammadan faqad mat. Whoever worshipped Muhammad, he is dead. And whoever worshipped Allah, Allah is alive and will never die. And then he recites uh, Ayah 144 from Surah Al Imran Mama Muhammadun illa Rasul Qad khalat min qablihi al Rasul Afa in mata aw qutilan qalabtum ala aqabikum Faman yanqalib ala aqibayhi falan yudur Allah shay'a wa sayajzillahu shakirin Muhammad is nothing more than a messenger Nothing but a messenger. Messengers have passed away before him. So if he dies or he is killed, will you turn back on your heels? And whoever turns back on his heels will not harm Allah in any way. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward those who are grateful. And that's what Allah who says that it is as if the people were hearing this ayah for the first time as if they had never heard this ayah before, though it was revealed seven years ago. And of course, many of them had memorized it. And they were reciting it a lot in their salah and out of salah and so on. They were, but it shocked them now to hear this salah. And now it is that they re realize you know, the, the reality. They, they become aware of the reality that the Prophet وسلم, is dead. Omar radiallahu anhu, later on he would say, <coughs> my legs couldn't bear me anymore. His legs collapsed, you know, cave in, caved in. Uh, and uh, then, then he knew, then he realized that the Prophet was dead. There was loud weeping all over Medina, all over Medina. Uh, and there was a, a tabi'i. <clears throat> by the name of Abu Du'aib al-Hudali who came into Medina around that time. You know, he had never met the Prophet wasalam, but he had accepted Islam you know, and he was coming into Medina and then he, or, he heard all of this weeping and so on. He or, heard all of this noise and he said that this was like in the Hajj, you know, with everybody saying the Talbiya together. La Baik Allahumma La Baik, everybody saying that together, you know how it sounds sometimes. Uh, so Abu Du'ai was saying that this is the song that he was hearing, and he said, What's the matter? What is happening here in Medina? And they said to him, The Prophet has died. So we have all of these reports. Uh, the washing of the body of the Prophet was done by his close relatives, Ali and uh, another cousin of the Prophet al-Fadl al uh, and the uncle of the Prophet Abbas and so on, right? Uh, and they are the ones also who put him down in his grave. They went down into his grave uh, and they put him down into the grave and so on. The clothing of the Prophet was not removed, uh, whether it is for washing or for burial and so on. Uh, the clothing of the Prophet was not removed. Uh, their hands uh, did not touch his body as such. Uh, they washed him uh, and rubbed his body over his clothing. Uh, the salah, salat al janaza, was done uh, partly in small groups. There was no collective uh, uh, janaza that was done. So those who came in small groups uh, did so. Uh, one uh, report says uh, the uh, the muhajirin uh, did uh, salah. Then the Ansar did uh, du'a, the women did du'a, uh, sorry, uh, the, the Salah, not du'a uh, alone, but the Salah, the Janazah, uh, and then the, the children also uh, together, they did the Salah. So 
you know, was in some sort of order like that, but in small groups and not all of them collectively. And uh, there was uh, one uh, thing that they had to think about, uh, where should he be buried? Should he be buried in al Baqiya? Uh, and uh, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu said that he heard the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say, uh, a prophet is buried wherever he died, where he dies. Uh, so uh, he died, he was buried in, in the house of Aisha radiallahu anha. They had to lift his body and to dig you know, where he was, where, where the bed was. They had to dig uh, under that. And then they placed his body uh, into the earth. Uh, and as I mentioned, his uh, close relatives are the ones who put him into it. Uh, and uh, then they all, they all covered uh, the, uh, uh, the body with the earth. Uh, so that uh, brings us uh, to an end. Um, I took uh, more time than I expected, but I could not stop until the end. Uh, uh, you know, I, I know we are past the time, much past the time and so on, but since it is our last session, is there uh, any, are there any questions, any comments or advices or so? No, I just want to say that Jazakallah Khairan, um, it was really wonderful having you and it's, uh, you're so honored and pleased that you were able to continue this class and we were able to have you on board and we learned so much. We heard many good things about the session and may Allah reward you. May Allah continue to keep us uh, benefiting from you and you know, to keep in touch. And, um, you know, with that, our class comes to an end. Anyone have questions or comments? We can take some time as if it's, it's the final session. And it is an online class, so we are flexible with the timing. So if anyone has questions, you can post them here um, or unmute your mic and ask. Shortly. So there seems to be none. Uh, if uh, uh, at any time later, you know, your questions come to your mind, uh, I think you probably all have my email or some way of contacting me, phone or something. Um, uh, and we can have this for, uh, you know, discussions on uh, any aspect of the Sira that you want to, to discuss uh, or just to keep in contact with each other. Um, uh, and inshallah, we will uh, continue to be in contact. Um, uh, I will, of course, uh, continue to be in contact, inshallah, uh, with uh, uh, Dr. Abu Zaid. Uh, I hope uh, that uh, you, uh, all of you continue to benefit uh, the, from uh, these classes that he organizes, uh, from the teachers, uh, you know, who uh, help out, who uh, who deal with these classes and so on. Um, you know, I, of course, did not personally attend any of them, but I'm sure that they are very beneficial and uh, uh, they, they, these are ways for us, um, you know, to come together, for you to, for you to be together, for you to, uh, to even act and think, uh, think together, uh, and do things together, and so on. Yeah. It is important that we have, uh, <coughs> you know, not uh, uh, ourselves acting as individuals, uh, but acting collectively, doing things collectively to further the dawah. Uh, so. And then I say assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.